Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Breakfast Club. I'm not going to tell you what episode number it is because it's just getting overwhelming and too much. But we are very excited today to welcome um, Christine Wilkinson. Hi, Christine. Hey. Christine is a conservation biologist and PhD candidate in the Department of Environmental Sciences Policy and Management at UC Berkeley. And we are super excited to have her, her here today because charismatic megafauna. Um, and for those of you who I'm gonna need a bigger laugh, Christine. There's no one else here to like give. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> for those of you who don't know that phrase, it means like big, exciting animals, which are definitely not what biodiversity is all about. But um, even for someone like me, who's supposed to be more reserved about being just as excited about absolutely everything, it is a little bit exciting to have big cats on the show. So we are really excited to have you. Um, so let's see, a couple of quick reminders. You can ask questions at any point just by leaving them in the comment section of Facebook or the chat window of YouTube. And um, Christine, when you and I first met, it was as colleagues at the Academy, but you were actually not yet in a researcher role. It was, were you public programs, is that right? I was in youth programs youth and programs. Then I was kind of doing some aquarium volunteering on the side. Okay, cool. And was, so what were your plans already formed at that point in terms of like moving into this branch? They kind of were. I had already applied to Berkeley once and didn't get in. And I was like, I'm gonna move to San Francisco and reapply to Berkeley after a few years. So they were they were there. I just didn't know when they would happen. Okay, okay. So already less than one, don't give up. And then, um, and but but in all seriousness, like it is really cool. Like we were talking a little bit before the show to just really emphasize the fact that for a lot of people doing really, really interesting work in the sciences, like the path is not a direct path. Like you take some weird lines. Um, so just to go back even further, when you were growing up with science or research, something you wanted to get into or, the, or even like big carnivores specifically? Yeah, I mean, not necessarily big carnivores, but I actually spent my childhood in Queens, New York. Oh, and okay. I would run around like catching like big water bugs and uh, like trying to follow the squirrels and um, trying to catch hornets and cicadas and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, looking back, I think of myself as like a little scrappy naturalist, like running around the city trying to find all the animals no one cares about, um, which I think people do care about now. Yeah. But that and then like watching all of those nature shows growing up, um, I really wanted to be a little bit more like those folks on the nature shows like uh, Jeff Corwin and so on. And I kind of thought that the only path was to be a veterinarian. So I kind of was like, had my sights set on that for a second. And then I discovered that actually wildlife research is a lot bigger than that. So uh, when I went to undergrad at Cornell, I was a natural resources major and I ended up studying abroad in Kenya and Tanzania in a wildlife mm -hmm. management program where I kind of got really deeply steeped into some of those charismatic megafauna that you're talking about, but I also started to learn more about how people really matter in conservation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was a shy kind of wildlife nerd and I started opening my heart to talking to people more and not being as shy. And now I kind of look at both angles in my work. Okay, that's really neat. And I'm so excited to hear more. I've seen what I've seen in the presentation looks so good. Also scrappy nat naturalist, hence your like really good Twitter handle, right? Scrap naturalist. Yeah, the right? scrapping was too long for it. So okay, <laughs> all right. I'll throw that in the um, in the link section too, in case people want to follow you. And thank you for again perfectly balancing yourself in this weird sunlight stripe setup. Yes. Um, yes. And it was very hot on my arms, but I know, thank you for. I know it's a little little suffering. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and with that, I'll, I'll get out of the way and I'll give you your slides. And I'm sure we'll have lots of really good questions at the end, so I'll leave time for that as well. Um, yeah, thank you so much again for being here and we'll see you at the end. Awesome, thanks Laurel. So as she said, I'm Christine Wilkinson and I am a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley and I work with Dr. Maggie Kelly and Justin Brashares. And I'm currently talking to you all from Oakland, California, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Chichenyo Ohlone. Today I'll be mainly talking with you about my dissertation research on carnivore movement and conflict but I'll also be telling you about some of our future work and how you might be able to get involved. So we live in a world full of increasing coexistence challenges with wildlife. And early conservationists focused on maintaining a pristine wilderness and separating people from wildlife, which we now know is unrealistic. 
So my work focuses mainly on how carnivores move through developed landscapes and how they interact with people and their livestock. Human carnivore conflict is our short way of describing the negative interactions that can happen between carnivores and people or their livestock, as well as people's perceptions of the risks that carnivores pose. So although my current research takes place in Kenya, human carnivore conflict actually happens all over the world, even here in California. And for my dissertation, I was partly inspired by this 2009 paper by White et al, which argues that solutions to conservation conflicts like human carnivore conflict should be spatially explicit or mapped and should be informed by different types of data in order to fully understand and solve our conservation challenges. So rather than having only the traditional data we've used for ecological mapping, we should also include social factors, wildlife and human behavior, economics, and other types of things. And incorporating participatory mapping with other methods is one meaningful way to achieve this. Historically, conservation biology didn't take into account local community perspectives. And in fact, our field has a dark history of exclusionary and destructive practices, which we've only begun to address. But now many conservationists and other scientists are beginning to understand that involving communities in the research process is critical. And participatory mapping in particular can provide spatially explicit or mapped community perspectives that help us as ecologists and conservation biologists to really understand the status of wildlife, the dynamics of conservation challenges, and most importantly, sustainable solutions to those challenges. So for much of this talk, I'll be describing the participatory mapping method I use as part of my research and illustrating a few case studies that incorporate those data with other data sources. My study site is Lake Nakuru National Park and Soisambu Conservancy and the surrounding areas in Kenya. Um, Lake Nakuru National Park, which is to the west here, is one of only two fully fenced national parks in Kenya. And Soisambu Conservancy to the east is a wildlife conservancy that also has over 6,000 cattle and it's partially fenced. And Nakuru City up here to the north is one of the fastest growing cities in East Africa and it's directly adjacent to the national park. There's also really dense development around both protected areas coming straight up to their borders with considerable immigration into the region. So I think those of us nature show fans can say that we really enjoy seeing animals in their habitats without humans nearby. But as we know, social context and history matter. So I'm gonna give you some important context about the region where I do my research. So Soisambu Conservancy, as I mentioned, is a mixed use conservancy. It acts as a wildlife conservancy, while on the other hand, also having thousands of cattle, sheep and goats, and some other agricultural endeavors. And it also has a colonial history. So it's owned and run by Lord Delamere, who is the grandson of one of the most influential British settlers in Kenya, and whose father is pictured here with the former president of Kenya. And because of this complicated colonial history associated with the conservancy and the effects of that history on the present day, the surrounding communities have a complicated relationship with Soisambu and with wildlife conservation there. Also, although this area was historically open pastoral land with no fences, etc., there's been a lot of immigration into the area and subdivision of the land into agricultural plots and homesteads, which you can see here. So there are a lot of different people from different backgrounds with relatively new settlements, all of which can create challenges for conservation governance. And lastly, I'd like to point out this photo. It might look like the military, but it's actually the Kenya Wildlife Service, which is sort of the equivalent of the National Park Service here in the USA. Kenya Wildlife Service or KWS are militarized largely to stop poachers, but this militarization can lead to strain in the communities surrounding national parks and the relationship between communities and KWS can have a resulting impact on conservation. Combined with poverty, all of these socio-political factors have contributed to many conservation issues like poaching for ungulates, such as gazelles, et cetera, through wire snaring, which can also ensnare carnivores as bycatch, as you can see in this photo. And all of these are examples of why we say that human-human conflict underlies most human-wildlife conflicts. 
So here's also a little bit of ecological context. Historically in this area, there was a near extirpation of large carnivores. In fact, up until 2016, lions that made their way into Soisambu Conservancy were still being translocated elsewhere so they wouldn't attack the livestock. And the main carnivore species that currently live in the area aside from lions are spotted hyenas, striped hyenas, leopards, and jackals. There's also a network of fences in the area. The most prominent fence is around the national park, as you can see in these two photos. However, although it is an electric fence, you can tell from our grasp of the wire here that the electricity can sometimes be intermittent. So in this developed and very complex landscape, I wanted to understand what drives livestock predation and carnivore movement. And I'm doing a lot of this through the lens of mapping. The first question I'm seeking to answer is, how do wildlife navigate that conservation fence surrounding the national park? Secondly, how do spotted hyenas move in relation to human activity and other factors, especially since spotted hyenas are highly implicated in conflict? And lastly, what are the drivers of verified and perceived livestock predation in this area, keeping in mind that perceived and verified conflict can be equally important for conservation and for management? So how do we get at these questions? Let's start with the fences. So in 2013, the debate began in earnest around conservation fencing and its effectiveness and its overall contributions to conserving wildlife. And when I say conservation fencing, I'm mostly referring to protected areas that are fully fenced, usually with that type of electric fencing I showed you previously. So Craig Packer and a group of other authors on the left here argue that overall fenced protected areas are very cost effective at conserving lions and at bolstering their populations as compared to unfenced protected areas. But a group of authors on the right then put out a rebuttal that argued against this for a number of ecological and economic reasons. So afterward, there have been a few other papers calling for more targeted research to help us understand when and where conservation fences might be most needed and most effective, but very few people have answered that call so far. So our research will ideally add a case study to that debate. So before we started the participatory mapping that I talked about earlier, we already knew a few things about the study area. We discovered about 170 weak points where animals were crossing the national park fence, which was pretty unexpected since the fence is supposed to be impermeable. And here are a couple of examples on the left of what those fence crossing points look like. We also mapped the conservancy boundary and found large fenceless portions and poorly maintained fences where animals were crossing like here to the south. So we placed camera traps, which are motion sense cameras at a subset of the weak points where animals were crossing in the national park fence. And in the end, we monitored those cameras for a year. And as you can see, there are a lot of carnivores moving through the fence. Um, spotted hyenas in particular were the species most often seen in what I like to call downward facing hyena, but we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, however, our initial observations helped us to choose which communities to approach about getting involved in our research around carnivore movement and conflict um, so that we could target these communities that were close to the weak points. So for our second question on spotted hyena movement, we placed GPS collars on spotted hyenas representing five clans in the area. And spotted hyenas, as I mentioned, are highly implicated in conflict in sub-Saharan Africa and they're considered to be very adaptable in human dominated landscapes, but their fine scale movements in relation to people and human infrastructure are rarely studied. We set the collars to five minute fix rates, which means they collect a GPS point every five minutes so that we could get a sense of their fine scale movements as well as their broader home ranges, which is where they live. And for our last question on livestock predation, we compiled data on verified and perceived livestock predation by carnivores. And what I mean by verified is that, for instance, someone who experiences an attack on their livestock might call Kenya Wildlife Service, and then Kenya Wildlife Service has a process to collect evidence and verify which animal was attacked and by which carnivore species. And the verified predation records came from Kenya Wildlife Service and from the Conservancy. We wanted to map perceived and verified conflict together to determine what might be driving differences that we find. Which brings us to the participatory mapping. 
To gain a holistic view, we needed to gather community perspectives to overlay with our ecological and wildlife behavior data. Before I describe a few case studies from this work, I'll briefly describe the participatory mapping methods since some of you might not have experience with that. So we chose 16 major villages outside of the protected areas and we focused on villages that were near to the weak spots in the fence. And we had nearly 400 participants from these villages with about 12 participants in each session so that the completed maps that they were drawing on would be legible to us later. And the mapping groups were also gender stratified. So we had men on one day, women on another to encourage people to speak openly with one another. So when people arrived for these sessions, first they participated in a one-on-one -on -one anonymous interview using Open Data Kit, which is an Android app. And each person was assigned a unique pen color. We took a photo of the pen color within the app. So then when people moved on to the mapping, we were able to use the pen color to anonymously match each person's interview data with what they drew on the map. So this allowed us to match demographic data and attitudinal data and other things from the interview with what people feel is important to them in space. We were asking them questions about their risk perceptions about carnivores, livestock attacks by carnivores, attitudes toward carnivores and carnivore conservation and carnivore presence in the area. And then lastly, we digitized the maps using fieldpapers.org, which for those of you who don't know, um, Field Papers is a project of Stamen, which is a company located right here in the Bay Area. And it uses this QR code and these reference points to georeference the photo of the completed map, basically associating that photo with coordinates in space. After that, you just have to trace the drawings and make them into shape files. This georeferencing step simplifies a huge chunk of the digitization process. So now I'm gonna just jump into a few case studies focusing mainly on my first question around wildlife movement through the National Park Fence but also a little bit on the other two questions. So overall, mammals are approaching and moving through the fence much more than we thought. You're gonna hear me say the phrase trap nights a few times today. And what that means in this case is the total combined nights without technical errors added across all of the cameras that we had out. So over 2,800 cumulative trap nights, we saw more than 65,000 detections of mammals approaching the fence and over 3,600 fence crossings out of that. And out of the 38 species that we saw approaching the fence, 27 of them crossed at least one time. We also ran a logistic regression using the 175 weak points on the fence and a set of random fence points and found that the main drivers predicting weak point locations for all of these weak points were NDVI at the fence, and NDVI is essentially a measure of vegetation greenness soil type and distance to water. However, the top weighted model, so the best model, had only a very moderately strong fit, which might point to somewhat indiscriminate crossing by the wildlife. They may just be crossing wherever they can. And we used this behavioral schema to classify our mammalian fence specific behaviors from the camera trap imagery. And we used these seven behaviors as well as no cross. For our purposes, the most important behaviors were observed fence crossings into and out of the park, as well as carnivores searching or attempting to cross. So I just wanna explain what I mean by searching really quickly because it's important for the analyses that we're doing. Essentially on our cameras, what we were seeing is that carnivores don't really approach the fence unless they're gonna beeline it across the fence. And because our camera settings had a 15 second lag in between these photo bursts where they would take no photos, we wanted to use searching as a measure of uncertainty. What, at what points did these carnivores likely cross the fence, but we might not have seen it captured in the camera. So you can see this leopard here sniffing at a hole that we know other leopards have crossed at recently, and there's been no maintenance there. So we know that it can fit and we can use this searching behavior as a proxy for uncertainty since our camera didn't have the setting to pick up the carnivore crossing if it did. So carnivores in general had the highest crossing to approach ratio, both for observed and implied, which includes the search behavior, crossings, with primates not far behind. 
And the crossing to approach ratio I'm referring to is essentially the number of times an animal crossed the fence if it approached it, rather than doing other behaviors. So for example, if a spotted hyena approached the fence, there was about a 50% likelihood of it crossing. This is one example of how we can integrate participatory mapping into our wildlife fence crossing analysis. In orange is the per trap night approaches of carnivores to the fence. And the purple shows a kernel density estimate of where community members have seen or heard carnivores over the year of the study. And this estimate came from the participatory mapping data. We can see that the carnivores that are crossing near Mze Wanyama village may likely be going into the community lands and not simply crossing the fence. We can also assume that the hotspot to the southeast is due to the fact that there is no fence on the southern boundary of the conservancy, as I mentioned earlier. But what about this hotspot to the southwest? It seems like these areas have fewer carnivores crossing according to our ecological data, but a number of things might be going on here. First, there might be carnivores that have their dens outside of the park in this area. Secondly, we know that carnivores cross into Soisambu Conservancy at these sites, and that this fence at the time of the study wasn't very robust, so they could be crossing out. And lastly, we do know that people are poisoning carnivores in this area, and that their perceptions of carnivores are very negative according to the conversations we've had with them. So it's possible that people might perceive the carnivores to be very abundant because of their negative experiences and their perceptions. We also conducted a binomial logistic regression to determine what variables correlate with animals crossing the fence versus doing other behaviors at the fence line. The most consistent important drivers across taxa were microhabitat at the fence hole and connectivity to the conservancy. And the importance of connectivity isn't very surprising, but we were surprised to see the importance of microhabitat. It implies that the visibility in the area and perhaps the animal's perceived immediate risk matter strongly when choosing whether to cross the fence. Interestingly, most species were also more likely to cross in areas of high human activity. So we're currently looking into that further. Also, ungulates like antelopes, zebra, etc., were the only taxa with a strong over overall model, while other taxa, carnivores and primates, were much less predictable as a broad group in where and when they crossed. So here is a quick example of a hyena's vigilance before crossing the fence, demonstrating how microhabitat at the fence hole might be important. And there he goes. And when looking at fence maintenance, we found that maintenance is sporadic and has a net zero effect. We observed 14 fence maintenance events across all of the trap nights, and there was no significant trend in terms of effect. And according to our data, wildlife often breach the hole again within 24 hours, as you can see right there. So what does this mean for connectivity in this area? We'll let this guy cross. Oh, there he goes, all right. So this brings us to case study two. We've been identifying each spotted hyena individual. And you can see here, there's an example from our ID books. We take a left side photo and a right side photo and give the hyena an ID number. And each spotted hyena, for those of you who don't know, has a unique spot pattern so we can figure out who they all are. Using our camera trap data, we're currently in the process of figuring out which individuals cross the fence, where and how often. And because spotted hyenas have a complex social structure with each animal in a particular social rank, we expected the lower ranking hyenas to be taking that risk to cross out of the park more often. But contrary to what we thought, so far we have logged more than 56 different individuals of all social ranks crossing at just three of the sites. So what we've discovered is that first, the conservation fence is not considered a risk to these hyenas to the magnitude that we thought it might be. And secondly, many of the spotted hyenas with dens inside of the park seem to be exiting to hunt and scavenge at night. So the outside of the park might be serving as an important part of their range. So using the GPS collar data that we got from our spotted hyenas, we determine their home range and their core ranges from kernel density estimation. Here we have also mapped the hyena sightings from our community participatory mapping data. 
As you can see, part of the core range of one clan is adjacent and even overlaps with some communities where people have said that they see many spotted hyenas. And the same hyena clan moves to and from the conservancy every single day. From the two sighting hotspots in the south, we've since learned that there are two hyena clans that we are unable to collar and study thus far. So we'll be trying to do that in the future. And we can also see from this hyena's range that the community of Kikopi, which is located here, might be experiencing conflict. And we should consider reaching out to them in the future for more effective community-informed carnivore management. So these are all great examples of participatory mapping, not only providing data, but also providing helpful information for future research and for community-based conservation planning. And for our last case study, we'll talk briefly about livestock predation by carnivores. In arid ecosystems such as this, conflict with wildlife typically increases during the rainy season, since wildlife are able to disperse farther from permanent water sources. However, through our fence crossing analyses, we unexpectedly found that in our study system, mammals are significantly more likely to cross out of the park during the dry season. We think this might be caused by resource shortages in the park due to its small size, but we were still pretty surprised to see it. So here we see a kernel density estimate of perceived livestock attacks in the dry season and in the rainy season. And as we can see, people indeed say that they experience slightly more livestock attacks in the dry season and that the attacks are considerably farther spread out from the protected areas, which supports our unexpected seasonal fence crossing result. And these combined results can provide evidence for managers from KWS and Soisambu Conservancy to rethink the patterns of conflict that are more widely accepted for this type of ecosystem and plan more effectively for seasonal conflict in this particular area. We also used a Geddes Ord test to try and see if there were clusters of attacks or hotspots for people who experience higher rates of sheep and goat injury from spotted hyenas. And as you can see, there are indeed hotspot here. However, people experiencing high rates of sheep and goat injury also feel that spotted hyenas should be able to live within the national park, which is directly adjacent to their communities. And these results about where carnivores should live were reflected in all of the questions around where these animals should be able to live. And this shows us that some people view the fence as impermeable or as helpful regardless of its permeability. And this perception might be helpful for conservation outcomes. So what does all this mean? Well, first in this developed ecosystem, wildlife are moving in and out of protected areas as well as between them. Ungulates seem to be the only taxa consistently restrained by the fence, likely due to body size and agility abilities. And because of fence maintenance might have a inconsistent effects, park managers should consider permanent fence restructuring or maybe diverting money to community education and empowerment. And in fact, looking at the economic impacts of fencing, as well as the economics behind structuring fences and maintaining them might be something that we see a lot in this debate in the future. Also, perceptions matter. People's perceptions of the fence as helpful or impermeable might be just as important for conservation as the fence's actual permeability. So this is just the tip of the iceberg for this particular study, but we can already see that integrating methods can lead us toward deeper understanding and hopefully more holistic solutions. So for this research, my next steps are going to be um, looking at the ecological and social drivers of verified and perceived conflict, as well as hyena movement. I'm trying to understand the relationships between gender, carnivore conflict, and conservation, and using human attitudes and other social factors to try to predict ecological and wildlife behavioral responses, if we can. And another thing that's really interesting that's happening in this area is a lot of the conservation managers have been having sporadic conversations around building or creating wildlife corridors in the area. So these analyses will help to inform those wildlife corridor conservations. So I've talked to you quite a bit about conflict with carnivores, but I haven't yet mentioned any of the many tools and interventions we have for dealing with that conflict. So I put a few up here. For example, here is Soisambu Conservancy. They have predator-proof enclosures or predator-proof bomas, as we call them. And not only do they keep the cattle packed in nice and tight, and they're very high, and there's some netting here, so predators are a little less tempted to go in, 
but they're also movable. So you can allow the landscape to replenish by moving them around. Um, and then livestock guardian dogs. I'm sure some of you have seen these. These are kind of an obvious tool to use. They, they protect the sheep from wolves and other predators. And here's something we call flagry. Um, wolves are actually afraid of this, or they get deterred by this flagry. So this is something, a tool that people use putting around their livestock enclosures. And there are so many more. So I'm just naming a few to give you some ideas. However, over the past few years, several reviews have come out that essentially say that we don't really know the effectiveness of all of these interventions that we have out on the landscape globally. Um, there's very little empirical evidence to be able to assess the effectiveness of the inter these interventions. And all of these authors have called for us to really dive deep into studies that can have a high standard of data collection in being able to contribute to the body of evidence around the effectiveness of these interventions so that we know what's the most cost effective, what can be out there on the landscape and for how long, which interventions to combine with each other, et cetera. So in keeping with that call, my um, awesome co-authors and I just had a paper come out called an ecological framework for contextualizing carnivore livestock conflict. And this framework is essentially trying to address the ecology of carnivore livestock conflict. So I've told you a lot about these sociopolitical aspects that come into play for this problem. There's a lot of context specific history, socioeconomics, politics that underlie conflict and influence conflict, et cetera. But at the core of a predation event on livestock is this ecological aspect, which is predation. And we have studied predator-prey relationships for so many years in the field of ecology. So what my co-authors and I wanted to do was come up with a way to apply these, this existing very large body of ecological knowledge and theories about predator-prey interactions to this problem of domestic prey being attacked in a new way. So we created this framework and we essentially described how different ecological theories act on livestock ecology, carnivore ecology, and the biophysical landscape, how they act together in order to influence a predation event. And then we wanted to use this framework to illustrate a few case studies. We had a case study on snow leopards, one on wolves and one on pumas, and talked about how the interventions that they used in those case studies acted on specific aspects of this framework and how that made those interventions successful or not. So the goal with this framework is to have managers and researchers be able to answer that call of evaluating intervention effectiveness by looking at the basic ecology of the system that they're working in. So my goal is to graduate in May, crossing my fingers, and as part of my post-grad plans, I'm hoping to also contribute to the standardization of the data collection on intervention effectiveness. And one of the biggest barriers to collecting and evaluating data on the effectiveness of conflict interventions is that there is no real standardized way of collecting these data on the interventions. A group of us who met at a conflict and coexistence summit organized by Defenders of Wildlife last October formed a working group to address this problem. And our goal was to create a dynamic guidebook or platform for evaluating human wildlife conflict intervention effectiveness globally. So this is of course a huge, huge task. So recently the working group decided it might be good for a postdoc to try to apply for some funding to get it off the ground. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. Applying for this funding to work with these groups, defenders of wildlife, USDA, ranchers, academic institutions, et cetera. And if I get the funding, I'll be conducting research to both inform and test out this dynamic guidebook. So for instance, gathering data on why aren't ranchers or other practitioners collecting these data and what do they need to do so? And what does it look like and how feasible is it to collect data of a high scientific standard in order to evaluate these interventions? This is gonna be a long-term collaborative and iterative project, but the end goals are both coexistence and saving costs for the people on the ground who need to use these inter interventions to survive or maintain their livelihoods. So the other main project I'm involved in is one where folks who are listening might be able to help. Um, as part of the IUCN Hyena Specialist Group, I've recently been tasked with finishing up the data wrangling for the creation of the latest range maps for all four hyena species. 
Yes, there are four hyena species. You can see them here. And yes, hyena can be spelled with an A or without one. And another fun fact, hyenas are in the same suborder as cats, which is Feliformia. So despite their appearance, they are actually more like cats than like dogs. So these new range maps that we're working on will help to inform the IUCN Red List and other initiatives, basically helping to fill in the gaps on the status of these species. So for example, our wolves in particular are so difficult to see in the wild that their current listing of least concern might not be accurate. We're hoping that the latest data might better inform us on this. And part of finding and organizing the remaining data involves combing the web for geo-referenced photos of these species. So these are photos where we know the location they were taken. So here's where you all come in. If any of you have pictures that you've taken of these species in the wild in the past few years while you're on vacation, or for those of you who are watching around the world near your homes, please get in contact with me. And lastly, some of you may be wondering how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting conservation in Kenya, where I work. So many African countries rely on wildlife tourism as a major component of their GDP, and Kenya is no exception. Not only do international tourists contribute money directly to the conservation sector, they also bring money to various other aspects of the economy just by visiting the country. And because of this heavy reliance on international tourism, a sudden drop in international tourism to literally zero has been devastating to wildlife conservation and has had cascading effects on the economy as a whole in Kenya and in other African countries. Personally, my friends in Kenya, including people who work in the wildlife sector and people who don't, are in a state of enormous uncertainty. Many people have been furloughed or put out of work in the wildlife sector entirely due to COVID, and poverty was already high in many areas before the crisis hit. And in fact, despite the huge risk of people bringing in the virus from other countries, Kenya recently slashed many of the national park entry fees by half and has just reopened its borders to international flights starting this past Saturday. Largely because of Kenya's reliance on international tourism, residents of the 47 of 47 of the 50 U.S. states are now allowed to enter Kenya without quarantining upon arrival, which some people think could be disastrous. So what can be done about all of this? Well, in the long term, wildlife conservation and economies overall in Africa need strategies to become more stable and less vulnerable to devastating effects from stochastic events like this pandemic. Peter Lindsay and his colleagues in their recent paper outline a number of strategies for doing this. Along with immediate support from international donors, there needs to be an overall shift toward combining conservation and development goals and a real effort to assure that local communities benefit directly from wildlife while encouraging community-based enterprises. From what I've seen in my participatory research, for communities living near protected areas, poverty not only plays a huge role in wildlife conservation, it is influenced directly by wildlife conservation through many levers. These communities, for instance, are the most likely to bear the costs of human wildlife conflicts, but also with the proper equitable structures in place can be the most likely to benefit from consumptive and tourism uses of wildlife. So I highly recommend taking a look at the new paper I mentioned, seeing if you might have a role in shifting to more stable and just wildlife conservation scenarios there. And lastly, I'd just like to put in a plug for Black Mammalogists Week, save the date. It's gonna be September 13th to 18th. Um, I'm planning it with several other awesome folks and I just wanna call out this artwork by my good friend, Sean Edgerton, check him out. He just made this just for Black Mammalogists Week, as you saw with the Black Power Fist. Um, and in keeping with the tradition of Black Birders Week, which is what spawned all of these awesome initiatives um, in June, we'll be having different themes every single day. We'll have different speakers, ways for the public to get engaged and some giveaways. So. Keep your eye out for that and get involved. And please reach out to me if you have any thoughts or ways that you wanna contribute. And with that, I'd like to thank my funders, especially National Geographic Society, the National Science Foundation and the Switzer Foundation, as well as my field team and my undergrad research assistants, and of course my labs at UC Berkeley. And I welcome any questions that you have. We have lots, thank you. That was awesome. You can hear me okay? I can. Okay, great. 
Um, so I am going to start. Well, actually, one thing, I, this is just for me, but one thing that um, I found really interesting is just I hadn't really thought concretely before about how the role, how humans perception just must be such play a big role in like basically almost all conservation issues today. And I was curious, um, is there any existing thinking about the best ways to kind of combat problems of perception? That's a really, really good question. There is a lot of um, work around how to change behaviors and how to change attitudes, which are two very different things. And right. you can imagine attitudes are much harder to change, right? And also there's a lot of ethical problems around trying to change people's attitudes, right? Like where are those changes coming from yeah. to try and change those perceptions? Um, there is a lot, I didn't mention this, but one of the interventions that um, we'll be thinking about with the creation of that guidebook, if I get the funding, um, is education. And so education is a way of not only informing people with information, but also it can change attitudes and thus behaviors and perceptions and things like that. So we actually don't know how effective education is for conservation as a conservation intervention, right. despite having, I mean, it's, it's beneficial, right? Like kids get to learn things or adults even get to learn things about their natural environment. Um, and it's informative, but we haven't had, and it's, you can imagine it's very difficult to measure the effectiveness of education. So that's probably like the major lever yeah. that's being pulled on the perceptions front, but there are other folks working on other projects as well. Yeah, and I'm realizing too, in a way, it's just like an entirely unfair question because it's the same problem we have right now, which is getting people to, you know, wear masks or just change their minds about whether COVID's actually a threat and how it spreads, so yeah. Exactly, and a lot of the time it's not the message, it's who's, who's telling it to you. Yeah, right, okay. Um, so we have lots of questions, as I said, I'll dive into a few of them. First, some basics. And so half this question is from Vid and half this question is from Sophie. But basically, um, curious about what wattage and amperage over what kind of distances um, the electric fences carried and also just how and how, when or how people determine whether to turn them on or not. That's a really good point. Um, so the electric fence around Lake Nicaragua National Park is probably just like a classic electric fence. Like, um, I'm not sure over what distance it has or what wattage, but I can answer the second question, mm -hmm. which is um, there used to be a team of people that I think was paid to go around that fence and constantly check all of the wires and you know the electricity, et cetera. But there are some issues with budget in the area for like conservation funding. And now there are even more, as you can tell from what I said about COVID, where the fence is supposed to be on all the time, mm -hmm. but because they don't have people that are constantly able to just walk around it, they have some people who do an amazing job, but they don't have people constantly walking around it being able to fix those things. Sometimes there are solar pan panels that are stolen. Sometimes there are issues with the fence collecting, connecting to the electricity in the city where it gets its electricity from. Um, and I think there's sometimes just economic issues of, of paying the people who maintain it or having enough staff on board to maintain it. So when you are, when I'm saying that it's not electric, you really don't, you really don't know which yeah. areas of it are electric at any given time. Sometimes they turn it off, a small section off to maintain it. So that's a mm -hmm. different story, right? That's fine. We don't want to electrocute the workers. But other times, like I would walk around that fence and I would hardly feel any electricity at all. I had a tester and I had another way of testing it, which is a long story. And I got so used to it that I actually leaned against it one day and got electrocuted. <laughs> so don't do that at home. But like, that's like how common it was for it to just be so intermittent. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think it's just largely a maintenance issue. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're gonna, I'm also gonna give a shout out here to the summer intensive class from Columbia um, taught by one of our curators, Dr. Lauren Esposito and Eric Steiner. They're asking a ton of really, really good questions. Um, from Sydney, were people generally willing to map or share their opinions or was it difficult to convince them to participate? That's a great, great question because um, it gets into the ethics of doing any social science research. Um, so for us, we did a semi-random snowball sampling procedure where we made it very clear what the sessions would be like. So we were like, there's no um, you know, token money involved. You're not getting paid to do this. So if you have like some livelihood you need to take care of, like definitely prioritize that. It's completely voluntary. The only thing that we gave people was breakfast. Um, and the other thing that's really important in any social science research is 
you, the people don't have to stay. Like you're not forcing people to stay. So at any time yeah. people can walk out. They're very, it's very important to, to have an introductory ses session in these where it's very clear, like what the expectations are and, and people don't feel pressured. It's also really important um, for people who want to get involved to, to not be pressured to do so. Mm -hmm. And so to feel like they're walking in voluntarily, well, it's, they'll be more likely to stay in that voluntarily. Um, and then one of the most interesting things that I found, which is a little tangential to the question, was that a lot of people walked in expecting to be taught something. And by the end, they felt like the teachers, which is what, of course, we wanted them to feel like, because they are, they are the holders of knowledge, right? Um, and they felt like they, they had kind of switched roles. So um, watching that momentum build throughout, I think is one of the things that kind of kept people engaged yeah. in, in the sessions. Yeah. This is kind of a related question too from Eric. How, how many of the locals were scientists? Um, there were some people that I work with from the Conservancy and from um, Kenya Wildlife Service that, that do live locally in the area. Um, but there were very few scientists in the villages. So um, that doesn't mean to say, well, I guess it depends. So there were some people that are like engineers by training and mm -hmm. um, in the demographic data, we were able to collect their education and, and their um, positions. So there were some engineers, I guess, that came in, but not really any wildlife scientists. And I guess too, it's interesting because like scientist is kind of like a loaded term anyways, because it's like, if we're, are we asking like how many people have like really expansive knowledge about a thing versus like how many people have accreditation for their knowledge? It becomes really interesting in, in areas where um, local peoples have just tons and tons of expertise really. Right, and that's kind of the point of the participatory work is that this word scientist, I think is limiting and the holders yeah. of knowledge can be anyone. So right. um, I think science, you know, people who use the scientific method is like one yeah. label for scientists, right. but that doesn't have to encompass all of science. Yeah, yeah, but I like the way that you frame that just now because like that is, that's like a useful distinction as opposed to kind of the more loaded ones. Um, a way of approaching a problem as opposed to like the knowledge needed to approach a problem. Um, okay, so Teresa had a question about hyenas, uh, specifically clans, which you referenced a couple times. And she's just curious how, what hyena society is like and whether they're really strongly socially bonded. That's a great question. And the answer is um, their society is, has a very, very complex social structure. Um, and yes, they are called clans. The group of hyenas is called a clan. And the awesome thing about hyenas um, is that all of the females are ranked socially higher than all of the males. So even the lowest ranking female is ranked higher than the highest ranking male. Um, kind of awesome. And <laughs> I know, it's pretty great. And they can live in um, clans of up to, I think the highest one was like over a hundred, but that oh, wow. one then actually split. The ones in my area are very, very, um, they're like, between 50 and 80 in each clan. I think it's partially because they're kind of fenced in and I'm looking more into that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't study populations of the hyenas right now, but I am like, I have the ID book, so I'm able to see how many there are yeah. in each one. So they're quite big. Um, and the, the females usually like kind of leave their cubs in the den during the day and the cubs are kind of all together. Um, and the cubs also have rankings. So. The answer is like social rank really matters. And one of the interesting things, I'm, I'm not like an evolutionary biologist, but from what I know, having this social structure is um, in some way uh, correlated with intelligence in species. Mm. And in fact, there has been at least one study where spotted hyenas outperformed chimpanzees on problem solving tests. So oh, wow. this kind of trope that we see of this negative perceptions of spotted hyenas as like stupid and evil, it's actually not true. So a lot of things to unpack there, but I'll leave it at that. Yeah, um, we actually, we have a related question here too. Let me find it. So this one's from Jared and he asked, um, are hyenas thought by local people to be 100% bad um, or is it more complex? And is there a long history of that relationship culturally? That's a great question. Um, in many cultures in Sub-Saharan Africa, including the ones that I work in, there are very intense negative perceptions toward hyenas. Um, I know in some cultures they've been considered like grave robbers and to have evil spirits associated with them. In some cultures they are um, like, for instance, in some parts of Ethiopia, they're kind of like, they go into the cities and they kind of clean up 
the the refuse. So mm. that's um, I think an exception. Mostly they have these negative opinions associated with them. Um, they do have like a long-standing history in cultures there as being uh, associated with these negative perceptions. But popular media doesn't help. I mean, The Lion King mm. really shot through any chance they had yeah. of being uh, perceived positively. Yeah. Um, I mean, just to just yeah. debunk a few myths here, since we're on this topic, it, in The Lion King, we have the hyenas running around trying to, you know, do evil things, stealing from lions, etc. When in fact, lions are more likely to steal kills from hyenas, and hyenas hunt um, like up to seventy or more percent of their prey and scavenge the rest. So um, they're like competitors with lions, and lions are are the, the thieves. So. Fun fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that Disney's been real. Yeah. Well, there's a long, hyenas can also join like capable women in the line of like things that Disney hasn't done any favors to until <laughs> arguably until somewhat recently. But yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see here. So I'm going to grab this one from Sanju, who asks also from the class um, Is it more effective? And I'm, yeah, maybe you don't know this yet, but. Um, or your research hasn't shown it yet, but she asked, is it more effective to fence the carnivores in their own space or to fence the carnivores out of human land? Huh, that's a really good um, question. We, the answer is we don't know yeah. that, that answer. Um, something that's worth noting when, you know, we're thinking about where these carnivore populations should be and whether they should be translocated different places. Um, a lot of carnivores are, are territorial so when I mentioned that those um, lions were translocated from Soisambu up until 2016, um, they would try to put them in places where maybe there weren't existing lion territories. But if mm -hmm. they, I don't know whether this happened, but uh, there's always the risk of plopping, you know, a young male lion into someone else's territory, and that will that will they survive? We don't know. So right. this is just something to think about as we're thinking about all of like whether to leave animals in their natural habitat or move them elsewhere, et cetera. Um, we don't know the answer. The fence debate is raging. So yeah, that's cool. Um, I mean, interesting. <laughs> so much cool. Um, let's see. So, and I'm and I'm like looking sideways because the questions are coming in so fast. I'm trying to kind of arrange them. Um, let's ask this one from Chris. Who? And are you good to take a bunch more, or do you have yeah. hard stop? Okay. So cool. I know if I'm sweating, it's because the sun didn't ever move up. It's just moving across. So okay. I'm well, moving over. Just go ahead and hydrate and I'll, I'll string this question out for like a while. Um, this one's from Chris and he asks, what would make the larger ungulates turn away from those fences and why did the smaller ungulates end up being attracted to the fence? Um, so basically it's just about size. So um, the, I don't know if you remember the slide where I showed the holes under the fence. Mm -hmm. They, the, the larger things like buffaloes, et cetera, really can't get through the classic hole that's found around that fence. Whereas other things like warthogs, first of all, can dig, right? And probably are some of the diggers of those holes, in fact. Um, and impalas can kind of squish their way through. Um, there are only a couple of places. Um, one of them was a, a river crossing um, where essentially like there was a, a fence that had a river underneath it and buffaloes were able to kind of jump down into the river as were other large um, ungulates. So it wasn't entirely impermeable to them, but it had to be like a giant hole in order for them to get through. However, what you do see, and this is like totally not like something that I have any science behind, but you do see the larger ungulates kind of shoving their faces into the holes. And I don't know why, like they they spend a lot of time just kind of like can I fit today is what it looks like. <laughs> like I don't know if that's really what they're thinking. Yeah. And then um, these, you also see them communicating across the fence line with each other. Mm -hmm. So I have these pictures of like two giraffes standing right next to the fence on either side, one in the conservancy, one in the park. And you know, you know, you don't know what they're thinking, but yeah. I imagine that perhaps they would cross if they could fit. Yeah. Maybe one's like, I think you got it. And the other's like, I don't think I got it. <laughs> um, that's it. We also, so here's another crossings question. Um, were you able to, were you able to tell why the primates were less predictable in crossings? Yeah, um, I think that part of it has to do with just the sheer number of baboons that cross that fence. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there were four primate species, and two of them were most common: um, vervet monkeys and baboons. And the vervets 
are like a little bit less likely to go out into the communities and crop raid, which we know from our participatory mapping is a big issue. They go in to the farms and they, um, you know, take the corn and things like that. And you can actually see the corn like husks kind of strewn around the, the national park fence as they come back in. So I would imagine that just baboons are so much more likely to cross than vervets are for that purpose, mm -hmm. that they skewed the data in a way that the broad group didn't have a trend. Okay, interesting. Um, so I'll take this question from Carrie, but we got a couple that were sort of along this line and she's curious, um, or he, sorry, I don't know. Do poachers come into play with impeding fence maintenance? But just broadly, I think people are curious whether poachers play any kind of role in the overall um, conservation like situation. Yeah, so the park that I work in, Lake Nakuru Park, does have um, both species of rhinoceros, black and white. So they're endangered and they do have um, armed rangers around who are trained to shoot on site. So as you know, I mentioned the militarization of, mm -hmm. of Kenya Wildlife Service and it's it's in some, some people think that it's really necessary to do that. Um, so yeah, there actually was a poaching incident during my field season. Um, where I forget if it was more than one rhino that was successfully poached. Um, however, they they seem to be pretty infrequent. Like those those um, rangers and the fact that they shoot on site is a deterrent. I think from mm -hmm. if I had to guess, oh, I, yeah. I haven't done a study on that. But yeah. um, I've only heard of one poaching incident during the time when I've been associated with the field site. Um, the thing that's more common to kind of break the fence down is the wildlife themselves are mm -hmm. kind of, you know, going under and things like that. Um, and then every so often um, when I was doing these surveys around the fence, I would see areas where people had cut, cut it because um, I mentioned there's a lot of development going up against all sides of the protected areas mm -hmm. and people need things like, um, they need like firewood, for example. Uh, one of the biggest things that someone will come into the park for is firewood. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's like probably one of the only reasons people will come into the park. Yeah. And um, they might cut cut it to to get in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and also just like it's so the firewood is so necessary to, for cooking. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, you need to eat. So it and there's very few resources and there's poverty that um, when I was doing the community mapping in one of the communities, that community frequently goes into the conservancy to illegally harvest firewood. Conservancy knows about that. Everyone knows about it. Um, it's hard to stop. Yeah. Um, and also it's ethically, you know, confusing, yeah. right? Because people yeah. eat firewood. And I um, employ for the breakfasts that we had in the sessions, I employ local folks to make the breakfast. I, you know, get, well, I give money to get the firewood and the um, food. And they're like, well, you can either pay for the illegal firewood or you can go get it yourself since you live in the conservancy. <laughs> So I have my two choices. So it's just like an example of like there is, yeah. there are a few options unless you go yeah. take public transit to the city and get these resources and have the money to do that. So yeah. something to keep in the back of your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Maria asks, uh, and we also got several, several like this as well. How do you actually call her a hyena? That's uh, a complicated answer. So um, there are lots of ways that people do it. Um, the way that we did it, um, first of all, I was always with a Kenya Wildlife Service veterinarian, which is um, a rule that they have in Kenya to mm -hmm. have a KWS vet. And um, essentially, it's kind of like a little, um, I don't know, like a spy operation in some way. So I'm in my car and the vet's in his car. And then there's sometimes another team or two in other cars. And I have a speaker where I play recorded sounds of hyenas that are kind of these excitement sounds that they make. Whoops. Um, I can imitate one for you Please. later if you want. Oh, you want to? Okay. Yeah, right now. Whoop. That's the sound that they make. And um, it's often made in kind of like a gather around everyone. Like there's, I, I want to communicate with you. There's a kill, something like that. So when hyenas hear this and even other predators, which can be a problem if they come to these calls when we're trying to call or something, mm -hmm. uh, they, they kind of flock in. And so you'll see some hyenas responding to this and um, on a WhatsApp group, I tell them like, okay, uh, this is the one that I want. And like, I'll go this way, you go this way, you go this way. And like coordinating people all via WhatsApp while wow. I'm playing these sounds and then like taking it off my roof and driving. And then we get close enough and, um, 
they use a, a dart that's shot mm -hmm. out of a dart gun to dart it. And then we go down and we um, maintain, like make sure that its vitals are maintained, like treat the dart wound and put the collar on and then let it go as quickly as we can after taking some measurements. Yeah. And that reminds me, you have some um, objects to show, right? I do. So on the theme of collaring, um, yeah. we cut off the extra piece of the collar um, when we collar the hyena. And this is kind of like, you can see how rigid and uh, yeah. kind of robust this collar is because hyenas actually have one of the strongest bite forces in the mammalian kingdom. Um, in fact, their poop is white frequently because they can digest bone, they chew, crunch, oh, okay. digest the bone. So they're really cool. Um, yeah. Sadly, this is actually 1624 was one of our hyenas that got poisoned and we had to recover the collar, but this is, gives you an example of the material. Um, I talked a lot about camera traps. This is an example of a camera trap. Um, you know, batteries, settings. This is the part that's actually the motion sense part. Mm -hmm. It has these very like micro refraction um, material. And then this, my last object is an example of what happens when a uh, southern ground hornbill attacks and destroys your camera for an hour. Impressive. <laughs> it was. Those are some funny pictures, I have to say. Oh yeah, um, are they are they viewable? I know we're going to get asked. Um, they they can be. I can put one up on. Actually, if you go to my Twitter, there's one up there somewhere. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll drop. I'll drop your Twitter link in the um, in the thing again at the end. Um, okay. Cool. Well, let me take. Let's see. I'll take three more. How about that? Um, let's see. So Chloe asks, are locals opinions of predators improving or deteriorating due to conservation efforts? Do most pastoralists still view predators as a nuisance or threat? Um, the answer is yes. Many pastoralists still view them as a nuisance or threat. There are a lot of great initiatives around the world, not just in East Africa, where, um, pastoralists are kind of being, um, built up and elevated as these protectors of, mm -hmm. of the carnivores that they used to um, persecute, or maybe even making, um, you know, a certain amount of money from selling meat that's on a ranch that's like predator friendly, things like that around the world. Um, there's some great programs like um, Lion Guardians, which is in Kenya, which um, it has Maasai folks who used to um, hunt lions are now like protecting the lions and stopping um, retaliation from happening against them. So there's a lot of great like little pockets of initiatives around the world, which of course um, are fantastic and are, well, I'm not sure how spreadable and scalable they are, but I think that they're great. Um, and then, sorry, what was the first part of the question? It was whether locals opinions of predators are improving or deteriorating due to conservation efforts. In my study site, um, I think that they're just remaining static mm -hmm. right now, um, but we'll see since we're, uh, something I didn't mention is by doing these participatory mapping efforts, um, a lot of scientists who work with people are actually participating in something we call soft, dis soft diplomacy, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, we're not really trained for it, but it's something where like I can, science is never objective. Okay, objectivity doesn't exist. I just want to tell that to the world. It's always, there's always an agenda. And, and so even though we're told from as young scientists to stay as objective as possible, the fact remains that I, for my, the communities that I worked with was a link to Kenya Wildlife Service and I was a link to the conservancy. And kind of, uh, I was able to help facilitate a few conversations and bridge building um, between folks who wanted to build those bridges with the conservation management in the area. Um, so hopefully that those will kind of like proliferate as community members have more and more conversations with those making the decisions from the top mm -hmm. down. But um, I can't tell you that something's actually happening yet. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, okay, and then I think you referenced this briefly, but Cassie wanted to know how long you expect to be involved there. Um, how much, how long a study like this might last? <laughs> um, so many good questions. So for me, the, the like field work for my dissertation, like since I need to graduate at some point is done. I was supposed to be in Kenya right now, but COVID. Yeah. And, um, but something that's critical, I think for anyone who wants to go into social science is that it's really, really bad form to be a helicopter scientist and a dive in and work with people and then exit. 
-hmm. So I think that there's a lot of awesome potential to um, keep a project going in this area. And I really, 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 um, really want to do that and keep working with the communities. It's actually like one of the most important things to me at, in this work is just to keep it going somehow. Um, COVID is complicating that right now, but I'm going to get back there as soon as it's safely possible. And as soon as I won't be serving as a potential vector to the people that I work with. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then this question I think works really well as the last one, because it loops back to how you um, said that people could potentially help. It's from Ophelia. And she said, I may have some hyena photos. I went to Kenya and Botswana last year and saw some. Should I upload them to iNaturalist? Ooh, great question. Um, it would actually be more helpful since I think we've combed iNaturalist already if you could email them to me. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, my email address is on the slide if it was shared one more time. Here you go. I'll give it back one sec. Um, so we'll give you a sec to jot that down. Okay. I'll write it in the comments later too. Awesome. So you do, but you you have used iNaturalist to as a data source. So for just for background, um, the the IUCN specialist group leads um, mm -hmm. have been. I guess they started this effort like a year ago, and then they uh, one of them actually had a baby, so they were looking for a replacement lead, and that's where I come in. And I just got assigned this project um, last week. So oh, wow. basically, like we have, I think like seventy percent of the data. Mm -hmm. And then we just need the last 30% of the data before we start actually making the range maps. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, well, hopefully some people watching today can help with a few more observations. Um, it was so, so good. Thank you so much. I'll say quickly before I want to say bye properly, but I will say Breakfast Club viewers, Tuesday, August 11th is the next Breakfast Club we currently have scheduled. That'll be a virtual tour of the Academy Library Collections with head librarian Rebecca Kim, which is actually really cool because it is not just books, although books are also really cool. Um, so check that out. And also, it, I've never actually said this before because I'm such a professional, but please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you'll actually get notified when um, we have live streams coming back up. Um, but yes, okay, so Christine, every, we'll put your Twitter back in there. Um, we look really look forward to seeing about like what comes out of Black Mammalogist Week. I'll talk to you after about to see if there's a way that we can help with that on Academy channels. Um, and we didn't get to all the questions today, uh, maybe, Christine will loop back if she has some time and see if there are any that we didn't answer. But thank you all so, so much for watching. And Christine, thanks so much for taking uh, time for us today. It was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah.